<laughs> Great, thank you. Well, good morning, everyone, and thank you. Good evening to Dr. Jensen. Um, thank you for logging on to our Zoom seminar. I'm excited to introduce Dr. Jensen, uh, who is a professor of applied plant ecology at the University of Hamburg in Germany. Um, and he is also the head of biodiversity and ecosystem functioning research group. And his research interests vary from global changes uh, in land use, climate effects on plants and vegetation dynamics and biodiversity. He's published, according to my Google Scholar, uh, 203 publications with, oh. <laughs> I, I think so, and several in German, ah, okay. uh, which is definitely more than we can say. Um, I was first introduced to Dr. Jensen's work when I was a graduate student working on uh, seed dispersal and regeneration dynamics in created marshes here in Louisiana. Um, and I was reading his work on plant community dynamics and seed dispersal in wetlands. Um, and have been following his work ever since. Um, and we also have another connection. My very first graduate student, Victoria Unger, uh, I believe she's still um, a part of the research group there. I sent her an email. And, um, and she uh, was working as a, a research group leader in the coastal ecology unit uh, at the yes. University of Hamburg. Yeah. So today we're going to hear about the ecology of the Wadden Sea salt marshes in a changing world. Now I'll hand it over to you. Yes, thank you so much, Tracy. Thank you for inviting me. It's an honor to be here. It's a pleasure to be here. And um, it's also good to know that at least one person on the world has read some of my papers. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> it's of course also nice, kind of. So my topic today is, um, like mentioned before, ecology of bottom sea salt marshes in a changing world. That is a rather broad topic. And as far as I understood this, the whole seminar here, I could, I will give uh, a 40 minutes presentation. And in some parts, it's rather general. So some information about salt marshes, about the Warden Sea and about the changing world. Then also some, some information on how vegetation um, uh, is, uh, composed here in our marshes and how it has changed during the last decades. In the second part, I will talk more about these ecosystems in a changing world. So meaning in response to sea level rise and also feeding back to um, climate change that is um, on, on their function of carbon sequestration and uh, climate mitigation. This is of course, uh, kind of hot topic has been a hot topic during the last 10 years and a lot of research in different parts of the globe has been carried out on that. I will um, show you some results from the Wadden Sea. And in the last short part, I will also um, reflect a little bit on our current and also future research directions here in Hamburg, Germany. So that is what you can expect. Hopefully you will enjoy the talk and have a good lunch time beside that. So first of all, what are salt marshes? Of course, most of you will know that. So salt marshes are tidal wetlands and their vegetation is dominated by herbaceous plants. They are more or less distributed along the coast worldwide, especially in the temperate zone, like you can see here in North America, in uh, the Atlantic, and also along the Pacific, of course, also down there where you live at the moment. If you look in other parts, you can see them uh, in Australia, you can see them also in the um, along the European coasts and also in China, of course. And we, we are working here in the northern part of Germany, um, kind of the bridge to Scandinavia. And this area, which I will introduce in a second, is the Wadden Sea. So these tidal marshes are kind of important, of course, because they deliver critical ecosystem services. For example, they contribute to coastal protection and also to carbon sequestration, which I will talk about a little bit later. This is a picture of one Wadden Sea salt marsh. And maybe you can also already see here that they look similar to the salt marshes along uh, as at the Gulf Coast, but there are also different features. And one um, specific different feature may be that we have these straight lines here in the upper part of the marsh, so um, which reflect anthropogenic 
impacts. Um, and I will also talk about these anthropogenic impacts on the salt marshes and how long they have shaped our marshes in the past. So very short, what is the Wadden Sea? This is this area here um, in the Netherlands, in Germany and in Denmark, the whole coastline we call the Wadden Sea. It is known as the largest unbroken system of intertidal sand and mudflats of the world. At least it is stated that it is. I know, but I don't know really whether this is true. And it has areas in the Netherlands, in Germany and Denmark. And today it is protected as a UNESCO World Heritage Site. As our university is located here in Hamburg, it's only an hour of driving to coming to the coast. And then you have this playground of different salt marshes along the coastlines here, and you can do nice investigations about um, different aspects in these habitats. This is just another map of the area, and you can see again the Netherlands, Germany, and Denmark up here. In red, you have now the protected World Heritage Line uh, area. And what I would like to stress here is that also marshes are kind of shown in this map. And you can see that they are mostly outside of the World Heritage Site. And this is not because salt marshes are not protected in the World Heritage Site, but this is because the map is kind of wrong. Because what is depicted here as a marsh on this, on this map is not a marsh, uh, a tidal marsh um, today, but it has been in the past a marsh. And due to anthropogenic activities, all of these marshes have been lost, diked, reclaimed, and today it's agricultural lands all over here in the marshes, in the so-called marshland, and we have only small areas of salt marshes in front of this red line here, and this is the salt marshes which we have analyzed during the last 15-20 years. So to show this in a, a little bit larger map, this is a map of the coastline of uh, the Netherlands and parts of Germany, and it's 1,200 1, years before present. Um, and this is approximately the time when strange European people started to um, do strange things to the landscape, and here they started to, um, to use the, the salt marshes, which at that time were kind of natural habitats, you can see them all here, they, they started to use them, they drained them, they built also small dikes to prevent um, tidal flooding. And these dikes were built larger and larger. And today we have a seawall system protecting large parts of the Netherlands and also the North Sea coast of Germany. And all the areas down here, which are still depicted as marshes on this map, are not really tidally affected um, marshes anymore but they are diked and used as <clears throat> agricultural fields today. Be because of this huge anthropogenic impact, there was a large decline in salt marsh area during the last 400 years, which you can see on this slide here. <clears throat> so between 1600 and kind of today, the salt marsh area was reduced by approximately 80% during the last 400 years. And the reason for that was again land reclamation and extensive diking the building of seawalls during a really, really long time, 1,000 years. And all of a sudden, not that long ago, so um, it's now 20 years ago, um, no, 30 years ago, we had a paradigm shift from exploitation to conservation. So that means that at the end of the last century, people recognized that, oh, we, we, we should change something about, um, about our kind of uh, management system in, with this uh, landscape. And so they, they stopped diking activities and they stopped land reclamation and they um, kind of introduced nature conservation policies in this area. And you can see also that during the last then 10, 20 years, and we will see this later again, we had a stabilization or even an increase in the area of this um, salt marshes in the ones. I think I can skip this. We have indeed three different kind of salt marsh types which we differentiate in the Wadden Sea. And I will go just back to this map again to introduce them. 
So you are all familiar with barrier islands. So we have a system of barrier islands here. And in the lee of barrier islands, we have some small salt marshes. Here in the north, we have indeed a landscape which was with different um, kinds of, of, of islands, which are no barrier islands, but islands in the Wadden Sea, which formerly were connected to the mainland until a catastrophic flood 400 years ago. The coastline was here, and all these green islands called Halligan, they were part of the they were part of the mainland. So we have at least two different types of islands. And uh, we have different salt marsh types on these different islands. And in addition, we have also a, a different salt marsh type along the mainland coast. And this you can see on this slide here. So we have kind of natural salt marshes along the barrier islands and lee of the barrier islands. We have artificial mainland salt marshes, which are kind of built by humans um, by bringing structures into the bottom sea to increase um, sediment deposition and to increase then also the, um, the establishment of plants and the development of salt marshes. In the past, these marshes were then diked after approximately 50 to 100 years. Here you can see a seawall, and then people built these structures, waited 50 to 80 years, and then they built a new seawall here, and then new salt marshes were developing in front of the dike. Now we have the dike, the seawall here, and no no um, ongoing activities of land use in these areas, but still you can see all this, this history of the salt marshes over here. And then the third type of the salt marsh is this Hallig Island salt marsh type. This is small islands. They, they are indeed just, um, they consist just of, out of um, salt marshes and they are protected by a small dike, small seawall. They are um, only occasionally flooded in winter by high, higher tides. So they differ also from these other two types of salt marshes. So we know a little bit about the um, recent development of the area in the Netherlands, in different parts of Germany and in Denmark. And you can see that at least here in, in, in the Netherlands and also in some parts of Germany, we had an increase in the area during the last 20 years. This is now between 2000 and 2011. We have also now new data for 2018 or something, and we had a, a for, uh, further increase in the area of salt marshes in some parts of the world. And this is especially true for mainland and island um, salt marsh. Okay, very shortly, why is the world changing? That is, of course, one, one point is, of course, it has changed always. Second, now it is changer, changing faster than before. And the reason is, of course, us, um, because we behave as we behave. We have these carbon emissions, we eat a lot of meat, and this together um, is producing greenhouse gas emissions, and they are uh, emitted to the atmosphere. And so we have the increasing rates of CO2 concentration, and this um, feeds back to the climate. Yeah, it is, it is us. We are doing this. What consequences has these have these changes in atmospheric CO2 concentrations to the Wadden Sea? What we can see here is the mean annual temperature development in Germany between 1818 and 2010 in the left. And you can see that it increased from, on average, 7.7 um, .7 degrees Celsius. I don't know what this is uh, regarding in Fahrenheit. Um, by approximately 1.5 Kelvin to 8.9 degrees um, now. And as a consequence of an, an, an increase in the temperature, we have, of course, also changes in, in water levels. And the mean high water increased by approximately 40 centimeters, the mean sea level by 20 centimeters during this period of 1940 to 2010. Another large driver of change and vegetation change in these salt marshes is um, the change of management. So I, I told you in 1990, approximately, there was this paradigm shift from exploitation to conservation. And before 1990, almost all salt marshes were agriculture used by sheep grazing or by cattle grazing. They had all this very homogeneous green sword, tons of animals on them grazing it. And so we had a very homogeneous vegetation. And after the paradigm shift, the um, area of this intensive grazing or 
this grazing by sheep and cattle was reduced and more and more um, marshes were not used at all. So this is this blue. And today it is now 20 years old, but the numbers have not really changed. Today, approximately half of the marshes are grazed and the other half is not grazed. And this is also interesting for us because we can then analyze the effects of this long-term grazing and grazing change on vegetation and um, ecosystem function. So in general, our vegetation is very simple. So we have we can differentiate different zones um, regard, uh, along this elevational gradient. This elevational gradient is only two meters. So it is, a, of course, very flat landscape. And below mean high tide, we have a vegetation zone, which we call the pioneer zone. It's mainly dominated by southern cornea and spiritina and is flooded by each tide. That means twice a day. Then a little bit higher, we have the so-called low marsh community, usually a diverse community. It is flooded during spring tides. These spring tides occur twice a month. Um, that is why I, I tell my students always they are flooded twice a month, which is of course not correct because they are flooded maybe 10 times or 20 times per month during spring tides, but at least it is easy to keep in mind for the students. And the high marsh communities, they are above the spring, mean spring high tide, and they are just flooded during storm surges, which occur on average maybe two times a year. So it's very easy for the students. We have three zones, and they are all flooded twice, twice per day, twice per month, or twice per year. This is not true, but this is a simple model. Um, we started years back with describing this vegetation zonation and ask ourselves also, what is the reason for this vegetation zonation? And you can see three typical species here along the elevational gradient. We had 1000 plots of um, with species composition and elevation um, data. And we were able to describe their elevational distribution of the species um, along this, or the distribution of the species along this elevation gradient. And you can see, for example, this species is a pioneer plant. It is occurring mainly here um, at mean high water level or below. And then we have a low marsh species, Puccinella, and we have a high marsh species, Edimus atericus. And of course, this um, zonation is um, both due to different adaptations of the plants to this um, very, very bad growing conditions, high salinity and flooding. So you have to be adapted if you would like to grow here. And this plant down here can also grow up here, but then it is outcompeted by this plant species. On the other hand, this plant species from the low marsh cannot grow down here because it is not adapted to these adverse um, um, conditions. Okay, so that was all very simple. Um, when we started looking at these salt marshes, we were also able to see that they really change in vegetation composition. I will not, I, I will not go into detail here, but it is vegetation maps of some parts of the uh, Wadden Sea salt marshes. And this is before grazing here on the left-hand side, 1988. And then some years after um, they changed management from grazing to largely ungrazed, or this area in the blue frame here is ungrazed but you have also a small spot here, which is still grazed. And just look very briefly at the, at the succession. You can see we had homogeneous, largely homogeneous swarts at the beginning, and then it became more and more kind of diverse or complex or inhomogeneous. What we can also see is that this type here, Elimus atericus, this plant increased a lot um, in the salt marshes um, uh, in the first years after uh, the change of management and nature management were really interested why is this the case and is this maybe threatening also diversity of, of the vegetation. And you can also see that this does, did not happen in, uh, in the grazed areas, in the areas which were still grazed. Also vegetation changes here, but different vegetation changes. Maybe I can skip that. Um, so we investigated um, no, I, I talked about that. Sorry for that. So we investigated what favors the invasion or the establishment of this native grass, Elimus atericus, in our salt marshes. And we did a planting experiment along an elevational gradient over a couple of years, having plots with different surface elevation changes. So this is surface elevation change, low surface elevation change, medium surface elevation change, and high surface elevation change. And you can see that Elimus atericus was just able to establish in this regularly flooded salt marshes 
if you had a high surface elevation change, meaning that the invasion or that the establishment of this plant species is affected by elevation, but also by elevation change, possibly because you have with increasing um, surface elevation change, you, you have freshly deposited um, sediments, bringing in um, nutrients and also a better aeration of, of the soil, leading to a better establishment of this tree. After a while, we recognize that not all individuals of this plant behave the same. So indeed, there are two different ecotypes of this plant, of Elimus artericus. And so we investigated whether they differ regarding their potential to establish in these regularly flooded salt marshes. And we indeed found that one of the ecotypes is better adapted to high flooding frequencies. It produces higher total biomass, higher above ground biomass, and also higher below ground biomass under these um, flooding, high flooding uh, frequency treatments compared to the high marsh ecotype, which is really badly um, adapted to, to regular flooding. So another part of vegetation change is associated to um, this plant here, Spartina anglica. And Spartina anglica is also a very, very beautiful plant, I would say. Um, however, it is also known as one of the um, 100 worst invaders of the world. So if you look in this publication here, there's a list of 100, the 100 world's worst invasive alien species. There also Spiritina anglica is listed. And I, to be honest, I'm, yeah, that it, it may trouble problems elsewhere um, and it may also trouble uh, it may also lead to complications or to, to changes in the water sea but I was not really convinced that that the species is so worse so first of all I'm not really sure whether you can call it an alien invader because it kind of evolved in Europe in the water sea almost it is a species which has a very young evolutionary or origin only 150 years ago uh, European Spartina, European uh, Spartina maritima, fell in love in England to a non-native Spartina from the east coast of um, America, Spartina altaniflora, and they hybridized with each other. So, and this this hybrid then duplicated its chromosome numbers, and out of this hybrid, it was then Spartina anglica, which evolved in Europe. So, I would say perfectly. European native species, but we can discuss this later. Um, so ma major point here, um, I don't know whether we whether this is correct. Second point is indeed the species really increased a lot between 1989 and 2019, according to our data. That is data from Dirk Granze, a former PhD student, which analyzed vegetation plots from 1989 and 2019, and he was able to show that Spartina was really increasing in this uh, time and both in the pioneer zone, but also in the high march. So we, we, you can see in almost all conditions here, a uh, sharp increase of Spartina in that time. So is this bad? Um, we analyzed then also the effect of Spartina invasion on species richness and also on resilience of the salt marshes. And here you can see the change in species richness in this um, time between 1989 and 2019. And again, in the Spartina zone and in the high marsh. And then we differentiated uh, between areas which were already 1989 dominated by Spartina, no, not dominated by Spartina, and um, areas which were already dominated by Spartina 30 years ago. Now, this is both here on the left and also on the right, meaning that. On the, we have areas where Spartina already were dominating 30 years ago, and we had areas where Spartina was not dominating 30 years ago. And indeed, we had an increase in diversity in that areas where Spartina was already dominant in 1989. So you can say that this Spartina invasion, at least in our salt marshes, increases species richness. At the same time, and maybe also a reason for this increase in species richness, um, you have also we had we, we were also able to show that we have higher surface elevation change in the 
vegetation communities, which were dominated by Spiritina already back in 1989. So we had the highest levels of um, sedimentation, accretion, surface elevation change um, in these areas, both in the pioneer zone and also in the high marsh, which were dominated by Spiritina anglica um, 30 years ago. So meaning that Spartina invasion increases indeed the richness of the communities, but also the resilience of the ecosystem. Indeed, while we were studying that, we were all, again um, kind of um, seeing that not all these Spartina plants look alike. And we were able to sh show that it is not really everything is Spartina anglica, but we have indeed also two different types of Spiritina, an hexaploid, which probably is Towns Endy, the original hybrid, and a dodecaploid um, taxon, which is Spiritina only. But yeah, just to show you, even if you think you have good results, it is usually also um, the story is indeed more complex. Okay, that was the first part. And now I would like to. Um, go on and talk a little bit about salt marsh resilience and carbon sequestration. This is uh, not as long as the first part. When we started um, when we started investigating our 1C salt marshes, we were expecting that with sea level rise, we would have a marsh decline. Today, we know that this is not true. And we used already also some years ago, a large data set again of 1000 vegetation plots for which we had um, elevation data. And we resampled these 1,000 plots 30 years later, and we were then uh, able to analyze surface elevation change again between 1989 and 2001. And we found that overall, for all these 1,000 plots, the mean accretion rate of the salt marshes was 6 millimeters approximately. There's a large variation in these accretion rates of surface elevation change. And you can see this here um, that. In, in marshes with low elevation, we had a much higher surface, surface elevation change, almost 12 millimeters, whereas we had in the uh, marshes which had a high elevation above mean high tide or even higher uh, surface elevation change, which was lower than average. You can also see here that grazing or management has an effect. Here, indeed, in the marshes which were flooded regularly, we had an uh, increase of surface elevation change with areas which were grazed by um, by sheep. And the opposite was true in these marshes, um, which were just um, occasionally flooded. Here we found that without flooding, uh, without grazing, we had without grazing, we had a higher surface elevation change. That means higher accretion rate. That means that um, stopping grazing increased here the resilience of the ecosystem to um, rising sea levels. And I mentioned earlier that we have different types of salt marshes. And one important type is also these marsh island types called Halligan. And we were interested, um, as they are protected by a small seawall, what is the impact of the seawall on this um, surface elevation change? And also, what is, again, the impact of, um, of grazing? on these islands on uh, surface elevation change. And as they are much less flooded in general than the, um, than the salt marshes without a seawall, um, they have, of course, lower sediment input. And you can see also that they have much lower accretion rates. So the mean accretion is not 6.2 millimeters here, but just 0 0.3 millimeters. So they are really threatened by sea level rise. And you can see here also comparatively clearly that in the areas which are ungrazed, um, especially close to the edge of the island, you have increased um, sedimentation race, rates, meaning that the denser vegetation is able to catch more sediment when the flooding is coming onto the island, leading to a higher creation or surface elevation change. So the question here, to this question, the answer here to this question, are salt marshes threatened by sea level rise is, the answer is, as always, it depends. Um, if you are an ecologist and somebody asks you, you can always say this, the answer is, it depends. Um, 
Carbon sequestration is a hot topic also in, uh, in general in, modern, in salt marsh research. And the reason is, of course, that we have this massive problems with too much um, uh, CO2 in the atmosphere. And the question is how these ecosystems can contribute to climate mitigation. And we know that um, these blue carbon ecosystems have comparatively high carbon burial rates in their sediments compared to um, forests worldwide on, on an area, um, based on an area. And we so most of the data which was published here um, was based on um, studies carried out in America. And there were comparatively little information on, um, on carbon burial rates in other parts of the world. And we then started in the Wadden Sea also uh, looking at that. And one of my former PhD students, Peter Müller, uh, was the, the person who then published the first information on um, carbon sequestration in Wadden Sea um, salt marshes. They really differ from many salt marshes in, uh, in the United States because we have mineralogenic um, sediments and a very low carbon organic carbon densities. They are also comparatively well drained. So some of the some of the salt marshes don't really look as a as a real wetland. And what we found was that the carbon organic carbon density decreases in the upper soil. But if you go do down to 25 to 40 centimeters in these uh, in these cores here, you have a stable organic carbon density. So meaning we have higher carbon densities in the upper soil, but it seems to be that this is also decomposed over time. And if we use this um, car again, the current density and accretion rates, we can, of course, also calculate um, carbon sequestration rates. And we ended up with approximately 110 to 150 gram per square meter and year, which is less than the global mean of this 220 gram per square meter and year. So yes, they accumulate carbon and they can contribute also to kind of um, setting off carbon emissions, but um, we are not the world's best uh, in, in this uh, regard. Again, also carbon um, turnover is affected by land use changes. And we were looking here at differences in exoenzymes, um, which are important for car organic carbon decomposition. This is also a study by Peter Müller. And he was able to show that in um, grazed salt marshes, we had lower uh, um, enzyme activities in the sediments, leading to less carbon turnover and um, possibly also to uh, better carbon preservation than um, in the, in the non-grazed site. This leads me to the fact that, of course, it is not only the site conditions which are affecting the plants, but it's also the plants um, affecting the site conditions. So it's it's not only abiotic conditions which drive these ecosystems, but it's the plants and the interactions between plants and other biota, which are really important to consider if we would like to un better understand the ecosystem functioning of this ecosystem. And <clears throat> as Many parts, of, um, many processes are important below ground. We started to establish a rhizosphere laboratory some years ago and establish different methods for studying below ground processes. And one is plan planar optodes, um, with, by which you can um, demonstrate that these roots are able to shape their own environment in these regularly flooded soils. What you can see here is the rhizosphere of Spiritina anglica. It is the salt marsh plant of the pioneer zone. You know that already. And it is able to, um, to execute, or it, it has radial oxygen loss in the root tips. So it loses oxygen from the root tip, and this increases then the oxygen availability in these otherwise unoxic environments, um, increasing the oxygen availability close to the roots. It's also, it has also effects then on microbial communities, affecting also pH, and of course, you have also differences in the CO2 concentrations um, regarding um, distance of, of the route. So we are currently more looking below ground and looking into the interactions of roots and microbes and carbon turnover in these salt marshes. It is not only below ground 
post processes which are important to consider if we um, would like to understand better understand carbon turnover in these blue carbon ecosystems. We looked at the literature worldwide and we um, looked at literature how the interaction between animals, plants, and microbes indeed affect carbon turnover in these blue carbon ecosystems. And we differentiated here for, for this um, review study on a review paper on two different scales, the ecosystem scale and the rhizosphere scale. And um, we were able to show then that at the rhizosphere scale, we have mainly bibiotic interaction, an increase in kind of carbon cycling. So we have higher primary production rates if we have certain types of um, biotic interactions in the rhizosphere but we have also higher decomposition rates. And on the other hand, on the ecosystem scale or larger scale and mainly above ground, we were able to show that plant animal interactions so herbivory mainly is reducing primary production uh, biomass in uh, above ground biomass in uh, salt marshes and that also decomposition is rather decreased um, than increased by this, uh, by this type of interactions. So last but not least, some words about our current and future research, and this is more an invitation. So maybe there are some students, and maybe some of the students have not fallen asleep until now. And um, then it would be great that you have a look also at this slide here. This is our great research infrastructure, which we could also offer to you if you are interested. Some years ago, we were starting investigating effects, experimentally effects of climate change on um, the Warden Sea salt marshes by establishing a kind of unique, world unique experiment in which we um, actively heat the salt marshes below ground and we passively trap by a kind of to open top chamber or a dome approach um, heat above ground and we have then three different warming treatments, uh, an ambient treatment, a plus 1.5 degree treatment, and three degree treatment replicated both in the pioneer zone and the low marsh and in the high marsh. And it, we have deep soil um, warming in this experiment up to uh, 75 centimeters. So we have an experimental approach to look at the response of um, salt marshes in situ to global change or to climate change. And this warming is feedback controlled. This is, means that we indeed um, always measure temperature in the ambient treatments um, every, I don't know, 30 seconds or something like that. And it is then also measured in the other treatments. And according to the difference which we have, we put more or less heating energy into the soil so that we finally really get these differences, um, three degrees, 1.5 degrees um, uh, between the different um, treatments. And we have not too many results yet. Uh, we know that the system is functioning and the first paper which came out this week or last week or something like that is this which um, explores using the teabag approach um, organic matter decomposition in these sediments, sediments. And you can see that in our warmed plots, we have always a higher um, organic matter decomposition rate. That is the red dots are the warmed ones, the orange ones plus 0.5, and the blue ones are the ambient, um, ambient plots. And you can see that over the whole um, soil depth, we had an increase in decomposition rates. On the other hand, the soil, um, the, the stabilization, which you can also um, uh, analyze from this TBAC index, was not really that much affected as expected, probably because at least in the pioneer zone, temperature is not the main, main driver, but um, uh, low oxygen availability may be here the main um, limiting factor for, for stabilization. So we had some effects of warming, uh, decreasing stabilization, but mainly in the better aerated um, high marsh uh, parts of the soil. So soil warming in general accelerates organic matter decomposition, and this may, of course, limit future carbon sequestration. And with that, I think, I just would like to mention that we will open 
new um, PhD positions um, in about 10 days, 14 new PhD positions, which will then also partly at least work in these habitats, partly also uh, along estuarine gradients in our coastal zone. And if you're interested in that, I would be happy to see some applications in the future. And um, here's a short summary. I think I don't have to read it now. I would like to say thanks to everybody who contributed and thanks to you um, for your attention. Thank you. Thank you for the great seminar. Um, so right now I'll open it up for questions, you can just, I think, I see, let's see, anyone just raise their hand? I can start off, actually, I have a question. Um, so the grazing effect that you saw on accretion in the low marshes, um, yeah. you mentioned later that there's some potential for there to be carbon preservation during grazing. Is yeah. that the mechanism that you think is is influencing that? Or? It, it, it may indeed be what part of the mechanism. So with grazing, we have um, soil compaction and low oxygen availability and less decomposition, leading maybe also to a higher accretion. In addition, I would say we have also uh, less erosion indeed. If under a certain degree of grazing in low marsh communities, we have just compacter soils which are more stable against um, erosion. And so this may be also part of the reason that we have these differences. I see Shelly has her hand up. Yeah, I have a question for, um, so you mentioned that uh, for the parkour sea level rise elevation. So you mentioned that you design based on 30 plots right around for the sea level rise measurement and elevation changes comparing the different years so no, it's my... based on one sorry um, um i don't want to interrupt you thank you for giving the question it's 1000 plots so maybe i, 1, I plots. Oh, okay. that. Yeah. so it's 1000 okay plots. all right great so i saw that uh, in the result uh, slides there are many changes in terms of few uh, few 20 or 30 like a millimeter very small branch. So my question is, uh, for wetland uh, study like this with this kind of small thing, how do you deal with two major challenges when you design the experiment? So one is the, uh, you know, to to my knowledge, the best instrument we can use is RTK GPS. So the accuracy usually the best you can achieve is few millimeter to uh, two or three centimeters, quite common. So so that range is is the, the change is measured is smaller than that accuracy range of the instrument. And the yeah. other challenge is like when we, when we, like when we surveyed with RDK uh, GPS uh, for the wetland, the land is very soft. So we have to use those flat shoes, tip of flat shoes, especially using flat shoes for soft ground. But mm -hmm. even with that, with the two meter rod and the Artem instrument, um, on average, that would be the instrument will sink a little bit into it. Yeah. So how do you so managing measuring these kind of wetland plot yeah. elevation is kind of yeah. challenging because of these two. How do you deal with this? Yeah, we should have we should do a field trip to the to the sites so that you can walk on them. Then you would see that you don't sink into the soil. It is it is a mineralogenic soil, kind of stable. Um, the sand content is uh, comparatively high. So you can really walk on that. So oh, okay. um, this this is not really a problem. And um, the I did not talk about the methods. Sorry for that. So mm -hmm. we measured um, elevation by traditional leveling instruments. Um, so optical instruments, no no GPS based. So we have the marshes are well connected to areas where we have where we know really on a millimeter basis the elevation yeah like a benchmark nearby yes benchmark nearby and from there you can use these optical instruments and then you have a few millimeters of um uh, maybe error but okay. we applied the same method in 89 and in, in, in 2009 and I, I think indeed in 2019 once again 
and so it's kind of reliable but of course we have we have a variation and we have also arrows in it. Oh, okay yeah if your site is you said you can walk on it so yeah we can walk on like it it's on great. the lower right <laughs> or upper right image like that you probably have less problem with that yes all right thank you thank you Shelley. any question i'm scanning but just feel free to hop in i i, I have a question about the Halleg island marshes is that how you say it oh nice <laughs> um, island so if they weren't protected by seawalls, would they just erode away? Is there some, why are they surrounded by seawalls? Yeah, okay, so what, first they were part of the mainland until 400 years ago. And in 1630, a major flood event in Europe occurred, just washing away large areas of the marshes and some parts of the marshes remained. And this were the, these are today the Halligan. And these smaller seawalls, which protect the Halligan today, they were built afterwards. So they were not there when this major flood came in, but they were built afterwards, yeah, to protect the marshes. But indeed, this protection is not a long-term sustainable protection, I would say, because it is reducing the accretion rates. And with sea level rise, they have really problems. So there are people living on these small islands and um, they get increasingly problems to yeah, maintain their houses and um, yeah. Yeah, their that's living. something that uh, we've been thinking a lot about in Louisiana, um, the, the number one way to restore marshes here is to um, build a containment uh, levee or a containment dike and pump sediments hydraulically into the containment dikes. And then they're sort of left. I mean, some of them are gapped, but ultimately, I think the, the consequence is going to be what we see, you know, in what you're finding in, in the marshes where you just have a limited sediment deposition and flow of water and, and yes. accretion rate, ultimately. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so. Okay. Shelly again. <laughs> yeah, I have a, if no other have question yet or waiting, so I want to like to ask an, an, another question. So, um, so you mentioned that you have over 1,000 plots within this large area. So that is a, a very big design for a research project. So I wonder like for like how often you survey it, like within a year, do you four time or once a year? Yeah. And each time, how big is the crew member to survey that for 1,000 plots? Yeah, so these 1,000 plots, um, I, I'm just lucky that I um, I was, they, they were given to me, these 1,000 plots by uh, PhD students working back in the 1980s in this area on a certain project. And she was just crazy in Fieldburg and she carried out I think 3,000 plots along the whole Wadden Sea, um, in, in the whole Wadden Sea area, during three years between 1987 or 1988 and 1990, something like that. We just call it 1989. That is not correct. They were recorded over three years. And only one third of these plots have both vegetation and elevation data. And um, I use this for resampling. 30 years ago, meaning um, 2009, and then again, uh, no, 20 years ago, and then 30 years ago, uh, 2019. So, um, and, and we don't do it annually, and we do not go there several times a year. It is just to look based on this huge data set, which um, I what kind of heritage, is it an English word, heritage? Or, I don't know, it was given to me. Uh, from yeah, from inherited, my yeah, yeah, inherited. Thank you. Which I inherited. Um, I think I, I, I just thought I can make use out of it if we try to resample it. And so we went there again in 2009 or be, between 2008 and 2010, and now again uh, 2018 to 2020. And it was a team of maybe three to five students, um, the last two campaigns, and they really spent the whole summer out there. 
yeah, it was a lot of work, but also interesting insight. Okay, great. Thanks for sharing. That's a really um, big uh, design for for having that many plots. Yeah. yeah, I would not recommend that to undergraduate students, to be honest. <laughs> And also not to a PhD student. At, at that time, she just started. She loved field work and she started to go out there and she recorded as many plots as possible without a real question, in my, I would say. But I would not mention that to her. <laughs> uh, Elizabeth, Lizzie. Okay, I had a question about how y'all measured surface elevation change and accretion. You said that y'all used um, optical instruments for surface elevation change. And I'm just curious what that means. Oh, now I have to introduce this method. Um, so if you have a benchmark um, with known elevation, yeah, we use an optical, we, we use two instruments from measuring the elevation of another point with unknown elevation in relation to this benchmark. So you, you have kind of a meter, which is upward, um, and you have an optical element, an optical measuring instrument by which you look horizontally through this instrument. And then you can measure the distance of the horizontal line, which you look across to the soil surface. And if this difference changes over time, surface elevation changes also over time. Was this kind of clear? Tracy, please help me. Yeah. No, I know. That was great. It's a survey technique, basically. Like... Yeah, a survey technique. Yeah. An old okay. traditional survey technique. No, that makes sense. Thank you. And what time scale? Can you, for the 1,000 plots, what time scale was the surface elevation change measured over, approximately? Yeah. Um, 20 years and 30 years. So the first time after 20 years, and the second time 10 years later, uh, after initially 30 years. Thank you. Yes. I would like to but, but add the numbers that. which we gave then is surface elevation change per year, no? So it is then related to years so that we, you can better compare that to other um, other data out there. Okay. I would like um, to add a little bit to that uh, lovely instrument. We have a challenge to apply those kind of technology in, in Louisiana because Louisiana is well known for have um, like land subsiding, the coastal. So, so the benchmark will also have subsiding yeah. issue. Yeah. Yeah, I know. That's good that we don't have at least not relevant um, amounts of subsidence. So we are right on this part of the European coast where we have rather subsidence nor um, ele elevation increase. If we go further north to Scandinavia, to Norway and Sweden, the land masses are still increasing coming out after the last glaciation out of the oceans. And further south, we have more subsidence, but we are lucky here that we have more. It, it's not really a, an important process. I was wondering in, in your warming plots, if you've noticed or your students have noticed there to be an increase in height or productivity of the plant? Yeah, that's of course parts we are, we are looking at. And first results seem to indicate that we have indeed, um, at least in some parts of the uh, of the plots, uh, an increase in above ground biomass. Um, according to my memory, it is mainly in the uh, in the high marsh and not that much in the pioneer zone. And our hypothesis is also that overall the effects of our warming would be higher in the high marsh com compared to the pioneer zone because we have more the hydrologically um, controlled part of the marsh down there in the pioneer zone and then more the temperature um, controlled ecosystem um, further up. And it seems to be that this is also partly true. Thank you. 
Um, it looks like we don't have any more questions and I know uh, we're standing between you and a beer and some dinner <laughs> and your weekend. So thank you very much for joining us and giving us a great presentation. We really appreciate it. It's great thank learning you. about your work, yes. Thank you so much for inviting me and hope to see you somewhere. Yes, that would be great. <laughs> Yeah, I've, I've been threatening Victoria that I'm going to come to Germany to visit. Yeah. And I'm... Great. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I enjoyed the talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks Thank for joining. You. Bye bye. Thank you all. Bye. Thank you, everyone, for coming. And uh, I also want to let you know that the seminar continues next week, but this time it will be in person. And um, we'll be having um, Dr. Char Charles Hawkinson coming to talk about. Um, um, the metabolism and blue carbon sequestration of two wetland dominated estuaries. So if you're interested, we would love to have you there. And oh, Dr. Yeah. Kai could also join us. We could share the link with you. Okay. <laughs> join Every Friday night now. Yes, thank you. Great. <laughs> Enjoy. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you, everyone.